Chapter 15 Doc Brown had never seen his teenage friend so shaken before, but he also noticed something else, something very disturbing, that he hadn't seen in his previous love-struck moment. Marty, Doc demanded, pointing at the belt hanging from the teenager's jeans. Why are you wearing that gun? You're not considering going up against Tannen tomorrow. Marty glanced a little guiltily down at the weapon at his side. When his gaze met Doc's again, he shrugged and tried to smile. Hey, Doc, he explained. Tomorrow I'm going back to the future with you. He patted the gun handle self-consciously. But if Tannen comes looking for trouble, I'm going to be ready. He stood up straight, squaring his shoulders, ready for an imaginary gunfight. You heard what he called me last night? Oh yes, Doc Brown remembered now. Marty did always react badly to being called chicken, or yellow, or scurdy cat, or any of those things. It was the one failing of a very bright lad. Doc was certainly glad he was older and more experienced. It wouldn't do to have two of them with such failings, especially in a crisis. But how could he get Marty to see the error of his ways? Marty, he replied sternly, you can't lose all sense of judgment just because someone calls you a name. That's exactly what causes you to get into the accident in the future that... What? Marty interrupted. What about my future? Oh, Doc. Oh, dear. Doc Brown realized a bit too late that he shouldn't have mentioned that incident in 1985 when Marty's new 4x4 got into an accident. Well, would get into an accident, really, with that Rolls Royce. It was all the result of a stupid drag race down near Hilldale. The teenager had gotten pretty banged up, and then the owner of the Rose had sued. The whole thing hadn't been very pretty, and it had broken not only Marty's hand, but his spirit, too. The teenager had gotten so depressed, would get so depressed, Doc reminded himself, that he had even given up playing the guitar. And now Doc had blabbed Marty's future right to Marty. Maybe Doc considered Emmett L. Brown did have a fault or two. The teenager watched him intently, expecting an answer. I can't tell you, Doc admitted. It might make things worse. Like creating another paradox, Doc thought. And that was one thing they didn't need. Things were confusing enough already. Worse? Marty yelled. Wait a minute, Doc. What's wrong with my future? But Doc had said too much already. Marty, we will have to make decisions that affect the course of our lives. Doc nodded sadly to himself. You've got to do what you got to do. He reached in his pocket to curl his fingers around the flowers. Clara, what was he going to do with Clara? After a moment, he added, and I got to do what I've got to do. Marty and Doc had finally agreed to go through with the plan. So why did Marty feel like something was going to go wrong? They had waited until nightfall. Then they had loaded up the DeLorean onto Doc's oversized wagon, hitched up the team, and driven out of town. Doc had modified the DeLorean slightly the day before, replacing its rubber tires with metal wheels properly gauged to run on the train tracks. Once they had driven the wagon out to the rail spur that led to the ravine, they pushed the DeLorean off the wagon and onto a special set of tracks. Doc had devised to guide the car over the tailgate and onto the actual train line. Everything was going exactly according to plan, so why was Marty so nervous? Maybe it had something to do with the way Doc was acting. The inventor kept talking to himself. Sometimes he would look quickly at Marty, then just as rapidly glance away. 
and every once in a while his old friend seemed to forget completely what he was doing and just sit and stare into space until Marty reminded him what they were working on. And then again, there was that business about the future, Marty's future, that Doc had started to talk about before he clammed up. What could be so terrible that Doc would act like that? Not that, Marty reminded himself again. Doc was acting normal anyway. The inventor was probably worrying about those time paradoxes, where the past couldn't happen because somebody wasn't in the right place at the right time. Marty gave up. He couldn't do anything about it now, anyway. Before he could worry about the future, Marty had to get out of the past. Besides that, Doc was looking at him again. This time for a change, the inventor didn't look away, although from the grim look on Doc's face, Marty half wished he would. Marty, I made a decision, Doc said rapidly. I'm not going with you tomorrow. I'm staying here. Marty shook his head. This didn't make any sense at all. What are you talking about, Doc? There's no point in denying it. The inventor added firmly, I'm in love with Clara. You were right about this man-woman thing. I can't explain it, but I just know that. Doc took a deep breath. She's the one. He pounded his fist on the edge of the wagon. She even likes Jules Verne, Marty. She has all of his books. Oh no, Marty was afraid something like this was going to happen. There had to be some way he could still talk Doc out of it. But, Doc, we don't belong here. Neither one of us. It still could be you that gets killed tomorrow. He pulled out the photo again and waved it under Doc's nose. What if this is your future? But the inventor was adamant. Marty, the future isn't written. It can be changed. You know that. Anyone can make their future whatever they want it to be. He pushed the photograph and Marty's hand away. I can't let this one little photograph determine my entire destiny. I have to live my life according to what I believe is right. He put his right hand upon his chest. In my heart. Yep, Doc had really gone loopy. Completely off the deep end. But didn't he remember the reason Marty was here in the first place to rescue him from Mad Dog Tannen and all? Hey, Doc, Marty spoke again, choosing his words carefully. I'm all for true love and everything, and I like Clara too, really. You and her, you're kind of cute together. And if this were 1985, I'd say go for it. He sighed. He couldn't put it any better than this. But it's 1885, Doc. He pointed at the inventor. You're the Doc, so tell me. What's the right thing to do? He pointed to the Doc's forehead. Up here. Doc blinked, then sighed, then nodded. He knew Marty was right. He reached past the teenager to pull the release lever on the side of the wagon. The DeLorean ran down the temporary rails onto the train track. I'll be back in an hour or two, Marty, Doc said sadly. I've at least got to tell her goodbye. Marty shook his head. The inventor wasn't thinking straight. Doc, you can't. What are you going to say? I've got to go back to the future? If you tell her the truth, she'll think you're lying. And if you lie to her, well... Marty sighed again. There's just no way you can make her understand this thing. But Doc was being as stubborn as ever. She'll understand, Marty, he insisted. I know she will. No, she won't, Doc, Marty replied softly. Hell, I'm in it with you, and I barely understand it myself. It was an impossible situation. What could they do? Marty certainly never would have left Jennifer behind. 
Maybe, Marty realized, Doc needed to do the same kind of thing. Look, Doc, Marty suggested. Maybe we'll... I don't know if it's a violation of all the space-time stuff, but maybe we could take Clara with us. To the future? Doc asked, quite startled by the idea. Marty nodded. Doc frowned and shook his head. As you reminded me, Marty, I'm a scientist, so I must be scientific about this. I cautioned you about disrupting the continuum for your own personal benefit. Therefore, I must do no less. He took a deep but ragged breath. We shall proceed as planned, and as soon as we return to 1985, he walked over to the DeLorean and rested his hand upon the car's sleek black finish. We'll destroy this infernal machine. Traveling through time has become much too painful. Marty nodded again. Everything that had happened since he'd gotten into the DeLorean had been one long, never-ending mess. This, at least was one thing both he and Doc could agree on. Great Scott. He had to do it no matter what rational explanations Marty gave him. There was simply times a man had to listen to his own heart. Once the DeLorean was set up on the train tracks and in his proper place for the following morning, he and Marty had finished setting up camp, and after a campfire meal of beans and beef jerky, which, quite frankly, was still not quite sitting right in Doc's stomach. They had unrolled their bed rows in preparations for sleep. Marty had drifted right off with the amount of work they had done. Doc should have fallen into an exhausting sleep as well, but he couldn't. His eyes wouldn't stay closed. His mind kept returning to Clara. He had to see her one more time. He had to say goodbye. He stood up at last, careful not to disturb Marty, and crept to where his horse was tied at the edge of the camp. Doc saw the light burning in Clara's window as he rode up. He dismounted, and as he tied Archimedes to the old oak tree in the school teacher's front yard, he realized he could see Clara as well. She was sitting there in the rocking chair reading by lamplight. She had let her hair down and it hung to her shoulders, hiding her delicate features in shadow. Doc could even see the title of the book, Jules Verne's Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, the book Doc had said was his favorite. She looked so beautiful at that moment, caught in quiet contemplation. Doc wished again. There was some way he could stay, some way they could spend the rest of their lives together, but it still seemed quite impossible. He had to finish this. He quickly climbed onto the porch and rapped on the front door. Clara turned and glanced out the window. She smiled when she saw Doc. Doc felt an ache deep inside his chest when he saw that smile for what he knew would be the last time. Clara put down her book and jumped from the chair to answer the door. Doc swallowed as the front door opened. Why, Emmett, Clara began sweetly. And hers was the sweetest voice Doc had ever heard. This is a most unexpected pleasure. Won't you come in? Oh, dear. Now that he was here, Doc could feel his resolve weaken. If he walked into the school teacher's house tonight, he didn't think he would ever leave again. N no, no, he stammered. I'd better not. I. Clara's smile transformed into a look of deepest concern. What's wrong? Doc couldn't hold it back any longer. It was better to come out with it and get this whole thing over with. Somehow, though. It almost sounded as if somebody else was talking when he said the words. I've come to say goodbye. Goodbye? Clara smiled uncertainly. Where are you going? Doc took a deep breath. He had to finish this now or he would never again find the strength to end it. I'm going away and... How could he say it? 
Well, I'm afraid I'll never see you again. Clara took a step back, her hand at her throat. Emmett! Oh, he couldn't stand to see the love of his life hurt like this. But what could he say or do to make it any better? Clara, he said evenly, I want you to know that I care about you deeply. But I've realized that I don't belong here, and I have to go back to where I came from. Clara took the hand away from her throat. And where might that be? she asked cautiously. Doc sighed. Marty was right. It had come down to this. I can't tell you, he replied. Clara nodded and took a step forward, as if she had made a decision. Then wherever you're going, take me with you. Doc bit his lip. Marty had been more than right. This was just too painful. I can't, Clara. I wish it didn't have to be this way. But just believe me when I tell you that I'll never forget you and that I love you. But Clara couldn't leave it at that. And Emmett, I love you, she said firmly. But I don't understand what you're trying to say. Doc spread his hands his fingers curling as if they might find an answer out in the night air. Clara, he said softly and hopelessly, I don't think there's any way you can understand it. School teacher stepped even closer, so that she was looking right at him, only a foot away. Please, Emmett, she insisted. I have to know if you sincerely do love me. Tell me the truth. Well, Doc thought, if that's what she wanted, how could he deny her? How, indeed, could he deny her anything? All right, then, he replied evenly. I'm from the future. I came here in a time machine that I invented, and tomorrow I have to go back to the year 1985. He stopped, waiting for her disbelieving reply, but she nodded instead. Yes, Emmett, I do understand. She did? She could actually accept that he came from the future and that he had to go back? Then Marty had been wrong. Doc should have known that an exceptional woman like Clara with all those fine qualities couldn't possibly I understand that, Clara continued rapidly, because you know I'm partial to the writings of Jules Verne, that you concocted those mendicities in the exception that you could take advantage of me one last time. And with that, she slapped him hard across the face. Doc blinked, stunned by the force of the blow. Oh, Clara went on, the anger rising in her voice. I've heard some whoppers in my day, but the fact that you would expect me to entertain a notion like that is so degrading and insulting. She stopped for a second to take a quick breath before she launched into Doc again. All you had to say was I don't love you, and I don't want to see you any more. Then that at least would have been respectful. She stepped back, slamming the door in Doc's face. But that's not the truth, Doc called to the wooden barrier. But there was no response, except perhaps for a soft sobbing sound from inside the school teacher's house. Doc turned and staggered back to his horse. What else was there to live for? What'll it be, Emmett? The bartender called cheerfully. The usual? How could the barkeep be so cheerful? It was amazing, in a way, that other people could smile when Doc Emmett L. Brown's world had ended. No, Chester, Doc replied. He had made his decision before he had even stepped into the palace saloon. I need something a lot stronger tonight. The bartender nodded. Zasparilla? He suggested. Doc shook his head. He had made it 
to the bar. It was time to drink his troubles away. Whiskey, he demanded. The bartender's smile disappeared. Whiskey, Emmett? No, you can't remember what happened to you on the 4th of July. But Doc wouldn't be talked out of it. He had thought about this over and over again as he had ridden Archimedes back into town. If he couldn't mend his broken heart, he would try to wash it away. Whiskey, Chester, he repeated solemnly. The bartender whistled softly. I hope you know what you're doing, Emmett. He reached behind the bar for the whiskey bottle. A fellow in a checkered suit and a derby hat, undoubtedly one of those salesmen that were always passing through town, shook his head where he stood farther down the bar. It's a woman, right? He called to Doc. Chester poured him a shot. Doc nodded his head. I knew it, the salesman said to a fellow next to him dressed in pretty much the same style as the man who was speaking. I've seen that look on a man's face a thousand times all over the country. He looked back at Doc. All I can tell you, friend, is that you'll get over her. Get over her. What could this fellow in the checkered suit really know about true love? Doc stared down at the shot glass filled with whiskey. Nope, he replied. Clara was one in a million. One in a billion. One in a googleplex. A sigh escaped from somewhere deep inside. The woman of my dreams, and I've lost her for all time. Doc put his fingers around the shot glass. The first fellow in plaid moved down the bar towards Doc. I can assure you, sir, he said, his voice somehow both jovial and full of concern, that there are other women. If peddling barbed wire all across this land has taught me one thing for certain, it's that you never know what the future might bring. The future. He let go of the glass. He could fill these fellows in on a thing or two. Oh, I can tell you about the future. He would forget about Clara one way or another. Doc started to talk. Marty opened his eyes. The sky above was clear and blue. It looked like it was going to be a beautiful morning. He sat up and stretched. Man, I slept like a rock, he called out. What time is it, Doc? There was no answer. Doc? Marty looked around. Doc was nowhere to be seen. And what was worse, Doc's bedroll didn't even look like it had been slept in. Marty stood up. There was no sign of Doc anywhere. And one of the horses was gone. No, Marty said aloud. Not again. What had Doc gone off and done this time? He had a sudden terrible thought. What if Doc had already gone and gotten shot? Marty pulled the photograph out of his pocket. No, the picture was the same, or at least it hadn't changed any more. Here lies and the date of death were still there with no name in between. So Doc was still all right, at least for the moment. But for how long? And what if Mad Dog Tannen ran into the inventor before Marty could find him? Marty decided he'd better get into town to look for his friend. If he didn't find him soon, Doc might not have much of a future at all. Doc didn't know how long he'd been talking. He didn't even know really why he was talking in the first place. At least, if he talked, he didn't have to think about how he'd lost Clara and ruined his life. Yes, that was it exactly. More talking, less thinking. He looked back and forth at the crowd that had gathered at either end of the bar. We don't need horses, he informed them all, because we have motorized carriages called automobiles. He looked down at his whiskey glass. He still hadn't gotten around to taking a drink. That was a problem with all this talking. It was difficult to simultaneously patenticate 
and drank yourself into oblivion. Well, Doc would change all that. He would take his first drink right now. But Jeb, one of the old-time locals, scratched at his drooping black mustache as he asked a question. Well, if everybody's got all these automo watsits, don't anybody walk or run anymore? Of course we run, Doc answered, deciding he could leave the whiskey for another second. But for recreation, for fun. Run for fun, Jeb asked incredulously. Now where's the fun in that? What's wrong? Don't they have women anymore? Doc sighed. Maybe this was just too difficult to explain. Maybe he should take that drink after all. Or gambling? Jeb added. Doc put down the glass. We have gambling, but it's all in a town called Las Vegas. Ha! laughed Zeke, another of the old timers. I've been to Las Vegas. He scratched at his snow white beard. Ain't nothing there but desert. No water, not even a saloon. Next time you're going to tell us, interrupting a third fellow named Levi, as he pushed up his derby hat, is ain't nobody got guns no more, neither. Doc nodded knowingly. Oh, we still have guns. Thank God there's something civilized about the place, Jeb exclaimed. Doc looked back down at his whiskey. You know, the bartender remarked to one of the salesmen, I ain't heard anybody spin a yarn this wild since that Missouri feller come through here a few years back. What was his name, Twain, or was it Clemens? Zeke leaned over the bar. How many has he had? He asked the bartender. None, the barkeep replied with a shake of his head. That's his first one, and he still ain't touched it yet. Doc looked down at his glass. Yep, he thought it was just about time to take a drink. Meanwhile, at a campsite just beyond the outskirts of town, Buford Tannen kicked his sleeping sidekicks awake. Let's go, Tannen demanded, pausing a moment to spit. I got me a runt to kill. One of his men sat up, rubbing his eyes, and lit a cigar. Still early, boss, he mentioned. What's your hurry? Buford grinned as he patted his revolver. I'm hungry, he drawled. Even though they were barely awake, all three men knew enough to laugh. Chapter 16 Marty jumped off his horse and ran into the blacksmith shop. Doc, he called. Yo, Doc! No one answered back. The barn was empty. Doc had sent the remaining horses to graze in a local farmer's field, just in case he and Marty really didn't come back. The place was totally silent. The blacksmiths fire out. The tools neatly placed back on their hooks and shelves. The place didn't look lived in anymore, and it certainly didn't look like Doc had been back through here. But where could he be? Marty had already stopped at the school teacher's house on the edge of town, but there had been nobody there. Where could he look next? Or had Mad Dog Tannen already gotten to Doc? Somewhere outside of town. Marty walked out of the barn and saw what looked like Doc's horse tied up in front of the palace saloon. Marty trotted quickly down the street. Yep, that was Archimedes, all right. Marty would recognize those brown and white marks anywhere. But what would Doc be doing in the saloon? He could hear voices inside as he ran towards the palace swinging doors. And one of the voices was Doc's. Marty walked into the saloon and saw his friend surrounded by a couple dozen locals all paying total attention to whatever the inventor was talking about. Doc, Marty called, what are you doing? Doc looked sadly at his teenage friend. I've lost her, Marty. Lost her for all time. Oh no, it was Clara again, Marty sighed. They didn't have time for Clara anymore. 
Come on, Doc, he insisted. You've got to come back with me. Where? Doc asked miserably. Did Marty Dyer remind Doc in front of all these people? He had to. There was no time for anything else. Back to the future, Marty said. All right, Doc said, resigned to his fate. Might as well, there's nothing left for me here. He nodded to the old-timers at the bar. Gentlemen, excuse me, but my friend and I have to catch a train. The old-timers nearest to Doc all raised their glasses in a salute. Here's to you, blacksmith, the fellow with the derby called. And to the future, added the fellow with the mustache. Amen, the guy with the snow-white beard concluded. The three drank. Amen, Doc replied as he lifted up his shot glass and drank as well. Emmett, no, the bartender called as Doc drank, but the whiskey was already gone, swallowed in a single gulp. Doc smiled and put down his glass. He took a step towards Marty. Somehow his foot never quite hit the floor. Instead, Doc fell flat on his face. Marty ran to his side. Doc! Doc! Wake up! Marty knelt down and shook the shoulders of his friend. Doc Brown grunted, then made another noise that might have been snoring. Marty looked up and saw a clock behind the bar. The clock read 745. It was almost 8 o'clock. How much has he had? Marty asked the bartender. Just that one, the bartender replied with a shake of his head. The man just can't hold his liquor. Marty stood up. Coffee, he ordered. Black. He looked out the window. The streets beyond were empty. There was no sign yet of Mad Dog Tan and his mob, but Marty had a perfect view of the new clock tower clock still on its wagon. 7.45, the clock said. Don't remind me, Marty thought. They were running out of time. Clara had had enough. She had come west to start a new life. She wanted to see new things, meet new people, and forget some of those unfortunate events that had happened to her back east. What a fool she had been. It was absurd, really, to think that people would be any different out here, to think that Emmett would be any different from all those other men she had met over the years. It was so absurd that she could almost laugh, except if she let any of her emotions out, she would probably start to cry. She hifted her suitcase up on the train platform and walked quickly to the ticket window. The train agent looked up and nodded pleasantly. I'd like to buy a ticket on the next train, please, Clara said quickly. To where, ma'am? The ticket agent asked. Anywhere, she replied. As long as it's far away from here. The agent arched an eyebrow and looked down at his schedule. Well, the number 19 to Sacramento should be arriving in about 10 minutes. It leaves at 8. Clara looked at the clock on the wall behind the ticket agent. It read 7.45, 15 minutes. Then, and she could leave Hill Valley, and Emmett L. Brown, and Jules Byrne, and Squire Dancing, and all the stars in the nighttime sky, she could leave everything behind. That'll be just fine, she answered, in an even voice. Fifteen minutes in Hill Valley would be nothing but memories, and maybe some day she could forget those as well. Marty rode Doc onto his back, then managed to prop him up to a sitting position, as the bartender fetched the coffee, the barkeep walked around the end of the bar and handed Marty a steaming mug. Marty put the coffee cup to Doc's lips. Marty tilted the cup slightly. Doc took a sip and made a face as more of the coffee sloshed down in his chin. He started to snore all over again. Son, the bartender said over Marty's shoulder, if you want him to sober up fast, you're going to need something a little stronger than coffee. Marty looked up at the barkeep. In matters like this, he supposed he should consult the expert. What do you suggest? he asked. The bartender grinned and waved a young man over to the bar. Joey, he instructed. 
Give me some Tabasco sauce, cayenne pepper, onions, chili peppers, and mustard seed. The young fellow nodded and ran into the back room as the bartender reached beneath the polished wooden shelf and pulled out a bottle of vinegar and a part of an onion. His helper rushed back with an armful of jars and bottles and dumped them on the bar. The bartender whistled tunelessly as he mixed all of it into a beer glass. Then glanced up at Marty. In a few minutes, the barkeeper remarked cheerfully, he'll be as sober as a priest on Sunday. Marty glanced at the clock by the bartender's shoulder. It read 747. Ten minutes, Marty muttered. Why do we have to cut these things so close? The bartender leaned over the bar, handing Marty both the glass, which was now filled with a uniform vile brown liquid and a clothespin. Put the clothespin over his nose, the bartender instructed. When he opens his mouth, pour it down his gullet, then stand back. Marty did as he was told, placing the clothespin over the bridge of Doc's nose, effectively closing off his nasal passages. The sleeping Doc opened his mouth to gulp in air. In a single fluid motion, Marty poured the contents of the glass into Doc's gullet. What happened next was quite amazing, in fact. Marty couldn't figure out what was more incredible. The strength of Doc's blood-curdling scream, the amazing blood red color of his face or the speed with which he ran from the bar to dunk his head in the horse trough. Well, no matter which was more surprising, the final effect was quite dramatic. Marty and the barkeep both ran out of the bar to find Doc's head totally submerged in water. Marty heard a gulping sound from the trough and realized that Doc must be drinking water, he hoped. When this was all over, that his friend would forgive him for this dramatic cure. Doc stood, took a deep breath, and fell on his face. That was just the reflex action, the bartender explained. It'll take a few more minutes for the stuff to clear up his head. The bartender grabbed Doc's arms while Marty took his legs. Together they started to drag him back indoors. Marty glanced over at the courthouse clock. It was 749. Marty realized that if they didn't get going soon, they wouldn't be in time for anybody to forgive anything. But there were others out this morning who didn't want to forgive anything ever. Marshal Strickland urged his horse forward, and his son followed his lead. There were Mad Dog Tannen and his boys, just like Strickland had expected, riding in towards Hill Valley. The marshal's horse walked out from behind the cover of the pine trees. His son's mount came out next. Strickland made sure that Buford and his boys could see the shotgun on the marshal's lap. That's far enough, Tannen, he called out. I don't want any trouble. But Tannen only grinned. Stay out of my way, he drawled. And there won't be none. Strickland reached down for his shotgun. I'm warning you. Tannen whipped out his pistol and shot the gun out of Strickland's hands. The shotgun flew into the bushes, half a dozen feet away. Strickland stared at Tannen. He'd never seen anybody that fast on the draw. Buford had turned his pistol on the boy. Drop it, sonny, he ordered. But Strickland's son still clutched his own shotgun. He looked over to his father, a silent question in his eyes. What could Strickland do? Tannen had the drop on them. He didn't want to see his boy killed. Do it, son, Strickland said. Yes, Pa. His boy tossed his shotgun onto the ground. Now I'm warning you, Marshal, Tannen continued in that same low-key voice. I'm here on a personal matter. And if you want to live to see your boy go up, you just ride out of here for a few hours and leave me be. The rest of Tannen's gang had drawn their guns now, too. Marshal Strickland saw four pistols all aimed at his chest. He had no choice. He had to leave. 
He sighed and turned his horse around to leave. Tannen watched the horse walk away for a moment, then raised his gun and shot the marshal in the back. Strickland fell from his horse. I lied, marshal, <laughs> Tannen remarked amiably. He waved for his boys to follow him into town. They all knew they had some important killing to do. The boy jumped from his horse and ran to his fallen father. Paul! He called, Paul! But Marshal Strickland could barely hear him. He turned to his son and, with his last breath, whispered, Remember that word, son. Discipline. I will, Pa, the boy promised. If he had his way, it would be a word that every Strickland would live by for generations. Okay, it's at this point that I probably should, uh, you know, pretty much start chapter 17, I guess, because we just finished chapter 16 up there. But I wanted to give you all a little insight. Um, the reason I'm reading this book to you all is because a lot of people can't get their hands on it and because I was curious to see how it differed from the movie. While there are some little subtle differences here and there, it mostly stays true to the movie. But the thing that you just shared about Buford Tannen and Marshall Strickland and his son, this scene was shot. It is included as a bonus feature on the DVD. And I have seen it before in TV irons of the movie. But it was omitted from the finished film. And I'm glad to see that they included it in this book. So I hope you all are enjoying it so far. And here's chapter 18. Well, chapter 17. My bad. Chapter 17. Between Marty and the bartender, they managed to get Doc back indoors and propped up in a chair. Doc seemed to be more or less awake, but had once again lost control of all his muscles. Marty looked at the clock over the bar. It ticked from 7.49 to 7.50. It was time to get serious. Marty slapped his friend across the face. Come on, Doc, get sober! Doc's head lolled to the other side. Marty looked up as he heard the hinge creak on the swinging doors. Hello, Seamus, the bartender called. Didn't expect to see you here this morning. Marty realized he had been holding his breath. He half expected the next person through that door to be Mad Dog Tannen with his pistol drawn. Instead, it was his great-great-grandfather, Marty grinned at Seamus, and his ancestor smiled back. Well, Seamus said uncertainly, something inside me told me I should be here. As if my future had something to do with it. But Marty's future was already being planned outside the palace saloon. Buford Tannen and his three men pulled up to the hitching post in front of the saloon. They dismounted and tied up their horses. The streets were deserted. Everyone knew what was due to happen this morning. Tannen walked down the dusty street until he was opposite the swinging doors of the palace. All right, runt, he yelled. It's eight o'clock and I'm calling you out. Marty looked up. The saloon was as still as death. The clock read 751. Just my luck, Marty whispered. He's early. What could he do? One thing for sure, he wasn't going to go out until it was time. It's not eight o'clock yet, he yelled towards the door. It is by my watch, Tannen yelled back. Now let's settle this thing once and for all, Eastwood, or ain't you got the gumption? Marty took a breath. Now that the time had come for the showdown, Marty realized he didn't want to shoot anyone, even Buford Mad Dog Tannen. But how did he get out of this, and what happened if he couldn't? Marty reached in his pocket. He had to sneak a peek at the photograph. The photo had changed again. Here lies was still there along with the date of death, today's date. But there was a name now between the two. 
the letters faint as if washed away by the rain and winds of time. Marty started to squint, but the letters seemed to grow clearer with every passing second until he could read them easily. Clint Eastwood. Oh no, Marty stuffed the photo back in his pocket and looked up to see Seamus McFly staring at him. Seamus, the same man who had told Marty he could have walked away from the fight, had come back here again. Seamus had said something about feeling like he had to be here, like the future depended on him. Could he be here to keep Marty from fighting again? Marty decided it was worth a try. Hey, listen, he called out the door. The truth is, I, uh, I don't really feel up to it. Uh, feel up to this, so I forfeit. Forfeit? Tandem blurted to his men outside. What's that mean? Means you win without a fight. One of his men answered him. Without shooting? Buford screamed. He can't do that. You know what I think? Tannen called in to Marty. I think you ain't nothing but a gutless yellow belly. Buford's boys laughed at that one. And I'm giving you to the count of ten to come out here and prove I'm wrong. One, Tannen began. Somehow Marty and Doc had to get out of here. But Doc was still in his stupor. Marty slapped him again. Come on, Doc, he pleaded. Sober up, please. Two, came the voice from outside. Marty felt a hand on his shoulder. He looked up to see one of the old timers. Get out there, son, the old fella with the derby advised. I got twenty dollars gold bet on you, so don't let me down. Three, Tannen yelled. The old timer with the white beard shuffled over to stand next to the first. I got me thirty dollars gold betting again you. So don't let me down, neither. Thirty dollars, Marty blinked. Some of the townspeople were betting against him. Four! The third old-timer, the one with the black mustache, joined the first two. You might as well face it, son, he said sagely. Cause if you don't go out there... Five! Tannen's voice interrupted. Marty had had just about enough of this. What? He called up to the old-timers. What happens if I don't go out there? By now, the rest of the crowd had moved forward to gather behind the old cowboys. They were the ones that answered Marty. You're a coward, a fellow with an eye patch said. Six, Mad Dog interjected, and you'll be branded a coward, a fellow who didn't seem to have any teeth whistled. For the rest of your days... Everyone everywhere will say that Clint Eastwood is the biggest yellow belly in the West. The oldster with the derby concluded. So here, the guy with an eye patch pulled out his pistol and put it on the table in front of Marty. Seven! Marty looked down at the gun, then up at the faces of all the men watching him. The way they were staring, it was apparent they didn't like cowards. I've already got a gun, Marty explained. Then let's see you use it, somebody else yelled. Eight! Marty looked down at the colt strapped to his belt. He thought of the photo of the tombstone. They all wanted him to go out there and die like a man. Nine! Marty's gaze wandered to the edge of the group and saw Seamus McFly. No, everyone didn't want him to go out there. Seamus wanted Marty to make his own decision. And Seamus had told him that a real man didn't always go out and blindly fight. A real man was somebody who could make real decisions about what was best for him. Ten! Tannen yelled. Marty had made up his mind. He stood, and he looked at the other men in the saloon. Hey, he said forcefully, this is ridiculous. I don't care what Tannen says. He's an idiot. And I don't care what anybody else says either. Okay, a little note here. Marty does not call Tannen an idiot. He calls him an asshole. But anyway, he looked over to Seamus. 
His great-great-grandfather smiled, nodded his approval. Doc sat up, blinking rapidly. Marty turned back to his friend. Doc, are you all right? The inventor looked around, trying to get his bearings. I think so, he said after a moment's pause. Whew, he rubbed his head. What a headache. I confess the only thing I really miss here is Tylenol. Marty let out a long breath. Now that Doc was all right, they could get away from this place and back to the DeLorean. Bartender, he asked. Is there another way out of here? The barkeep pointed to the door at the far end of the bar. Through the back. Marty leaned over and helped Doc to his feet. Do you hear me? Buford Tannen screamed outside. I said that's ten, you gutless yellow belly. The others in the saloon shook their heads and started to talk among themselves. Tannen's right, the old fellow with the derby muttered. That runt yellow. He's got about as much guts as a snake has hips. The white-bearded oldster added, The most sickening display of cowardice I've ever seen. The senior with the mustache agreed. Seamus stepped forward. Is that so? Well, I say there's a difference between being a coward and being a fool. No, sir, I'd say that young fellow's got a noggin full of horse sense he does. He grinned at Marty again. Good luck to ye, Mr. Eastwood. Marty waved back as he helped Doc through the door. Good luck to you, too. Doc shook off Marty's helping hand as they walked down the short back hall towards a second door. Marty opened the door and saw they were in an alleyway on the side of the saloon. Well, if they could move fast enough and grab their horses, maybe the element of surprise would give them a chance to get away. Marty started running. So did Doc. But the inventor wasn't quite as sure on his feet as he had thought. He stumbled, falling with a crash into a pile of cans and wooden boxes. One of Tannen's men ran around the corner and saw both Doc and Marty. Hey! the gunman yelled. A bullet whistled past Marty's ear. Marty realized it wasn't over yet. Chapter 18 Marty ran across the street, diving into the open door of a cabinet shop and right into a cast iron pot-bellied stove. His left shoulder rammed the door, knocking it from its hinges. It clanged as it hit the floor. Ow! You had to be careful when you got involved in this western action stuff. Marty massaged his shoulder. There would be a real bruise there, but nothing was broken. He was lucky he didn't hit the stove with his head. He would have passed out and had another one of those Clint Eastwood dreams. Dreams, Marty looked down at the solid iron stove door. He smiled just like Clint Eastwood. He took a deep breath and realized he was in here by himself. What had happened to Doc? Listen up, Eastwood! Tannen yelled from somewhere outside. I aim to shoot somebody today. I'd prefer it to be you. But if you're just too damn yellow, then it'll have to be your blacksmith friend. Oh no, Marty crept over to the window and cautiously peeked above the sill. There, in the middle of the street were two of Tannen's gunmen holding on to Doc and Mad Dog Tannen pointing a pistol straight at Doc's ear. Marty! Doc yelled when he saw his friend. Forget about me and save yourself! That was one thing Marty knew he could never do. Tannen had finally accomplished what he had wanted all along. Marty was going to have to face him. Marty pulled the snapshot from his pocket one more time. There were two names there now, Clint Eastwood and Emmett L. Brown, both on the tombstone, one over the other as if the picture had been taken twice. It looked like somebody was going to die, but who? Was this his future or Doc's? You got one minute to decide, Tannen yelled outside. Marty could hear the train whistle in the distance, the train that would have taken Doc and Marty to the future. 
and now a train that one or maybe both of them would never see. The train arrived right on schedule, and not a moment too soon for Clara. As soon as a pair of passengers had disembarked, she climbed aboard and walked down the car until she found a seat. A pair of men in loud checked suits sat across from her. Some of those salesmen that were always passing through Hill Valley. One of them was telling a long-winded story about some fella he'd had some drinks with apparently all night long. Clara turned away from them and looked out the window, hoping that would be enough to discourage either of the gentlemen from including her in the conversation. The way she felt right now, she didn't want to talk to anyone. All aboard! The conductor yelled at the end of the car. The train lurched forward, then slowly picked up speed as it pulled away from the Hill Valley Station. The fellow across from her was talking very loudly, as if everything he said was part of his salesman's spiel. Yes, sir, that poor fellow last night had the worst case of broken heart I've ever seen. He chattered on. And when he said he didn't know how he'd get through the rest of his life, knowing how much he hurt his poor Clara, that really got me right here, he nodded sadly. I don't believe I've ever seen a man so torn up over a woman. Clara turned and looked at the salesman. Could he be talking about Emmett? Excuse me, she asked politely, but was this man tall with big brown puppy dog eyes and beautiful silvery flowing hair? The salesman nodded enthusiastically. You know him. She nodded and returned. I'm Clara. The salesman raised his eyebrows in a surprise. Well, Clara. He said with a sincerity only a salesman could muster. If you have any feelings toward him whatsoever, go find him. I've never seen a man more tore up or in love than he was. And a love like that doesn't happen too often. Whatever happens between you two, I'd give him a second chance. Clara stared at the salesman for a second. She realized she was right. She stood and pulled the emergency cord. Emmett, she whispered. Iron wheels screamed as the train jerked to a stop. Clara hurried down the aisles, ignoring the shouts of passengers and the questions of the conductors. She quickly descended the steps and began to walk back into town. Maybe she thought it had been her own stubborn pride that made her want to run away from Doc. Well, she was a stubborn woman. More than one man had told her so. Only this time she was going to use that stubbornness to find and keep the man she loved. Marty heard Tannen's voice calling from out in the street. All right, Runt, time's up. He looked out the window. He guessed he was as ready as he would be. The two gunslingers still held Doc, but Tannen was staring in towards the shop where Marty stood. And there was another change, too. In the minute Marty had taken to get ready for the confrontation, all the doors and windows on the other side of the street had filled with onlookers. The citizens of Hill Valley were going to get their show after all. Marty checked out his outfit in the mirror at the back of the store. It was all in place, the hat, the serape, the gun belt, just like Clint Eastwood in a fistful of dollars. Now, all he had to do was act like Clint Eastwood. I've got a bullet here for you, Eastwood, Buford screamed. Aimed right for your heart. That was just what Marty wanted. He stepped out onto the street. I'm right here, Tannen. Mad Dog Tannen grinned. Draw, he demanded. Instead, Marty unbuckled his gun belt and let it fall to the ground. No, he said, slowly and confidently. I thought we could settle this thing like men. Tannen's grin got even wider. You thought wrong, dude. He drew his pistol and fired. 
Marty fell to the ground. Buford Tannen laughed and soldered over to his fallen foe. <laughs> Marty opened his eyes and kicked the gun from Tannen's hand. Tannen's jaw dropped as the gun went flying across the street. Marty jumped to his feet. Tannen rushed him, aiming a fist straight for his gut. He howled in pain as his knuckles smashed against something solid. Marty threw back his serape to reveal the cast iron door he had taken off the pot-bellied stove. Now that it had served its purpose, he could unstrap this thing from his chest. It's broke! Buford wailed, holding up his nerveless hand for all to see. My gun hand's broke! He looked up at Marty and growled, grabbing for the teenager with the hand he had left. Marty grabbed the stove door and smashed it on top of Tannen's head. The blow sent Buford reeling sideways. Marty threw the door down. The rest of this fight was going to be settled with fists. Mad Dog Tannen shook his head and blinked, then rushed Marty one more time. Marty socked his opponent square in the face, sending him tumbling backwards over a hitching rail. But you couldn't keep a mad dog down. Tannen staggered to his feet again and rushed Marty, hitting the teen with his right hand. Tannen had forgotten what happened to his right hand. He screamed in pain. He swung at Marty with his left, but Marty easily sidestepped the blow. This was getting pitiful. Marty gave Tannen a good, hearty shove. Buford Tannen fell into the tombstone, the same tombstone in the photo, breaking the stone in half. Somehow he got to his feet again, but he really couldn't stand anymore. Instead, he stumbled backwards into a cart Marty had seen when he'd first come to town, a cart filled with damp, fragrant manure. Buford passed out, covered in brown. Marty turned to study the three members of Tannen's gang. The three outlaws exchanged a look, and then, without a word, let go of Doc and started to run. They were followed quickly by three sheriff's deputies. Marty walked over to his friend. You okay, Doc? I'm fine, Marty. Doc brushed his coat where the gunman had held him. A young boy, maybe seven or eight, ran across the street to get a better look. Wow, the boy shouted excitedly. Armor! How'd you think of that, mister? Marty shrugged. I saw it in a Clint Eastwood movie. The boy frowned. Movie? What's a movie? Oh, that was right. In the thrill of the victory, Marty had forgotten where he was. Still, as he strode from his high school film history course, movies should be showing up pretty soon. You'll find out, he told the boy with a smile. The other townspeople started to gather around as well. One of them shooed the boy away. Move along, D.W., move along. Another fellow, wearing what looked like a Barber's smock shook his head. That little Griffith boy. Can't hold him down. Marty frowned. Remembering his film history course all over again. Griffith boy. D.W. No. Nah. All thoughts of history left his head as he saw another of the local deputies move quickly over to the semi-conscious outlaw. The deputy drew his gun. Buford Tannen, you're under arrest for the murder of Marshal James Strickland. Tannen raised his shoulders and tried to stand. In the distance, the train whistle blew. Marty looked over at Doc. That had to mean the train was leaving the station. Okay, I'm going to stop here for a second. Here's another, another uh, thing that's different in the book than the movie. He was not... Uh, under arrest for killing Marshall Strickland, he was under arrest for robbing the Pine City stage. Because that scene where he killed Marshall Strickland was omitted from the movie. But as I said earlier, it is included as a bonus feature on the DVD. Okay, let's get back to the book. Can we make it? Marty asked. Doc considered the question for a second before nodding. We'll have to cut him off at the Coyote Pass. Doc grabbed his horse and untied a second one for Marty. 
The second animal looked an awful lot like the one Buford rode. They both mounted up. There in the middle of the crowd, Marty saw Seamus McFly. Marty picked up his gun belt and waved at his great-great-grandfather. Seamus, here! He threw the belt over to the farmer. Traded in on a new hat. Thank you, Mr. Eastwood, Seamus replied as he deftly caught the gift. Marty looked over his shoulder as he turned his horse to go. And take care of that baby! Doc and Marty took off at a full gallop. Clara had made it to town at last. There was a crowd in front of the palace saloon. Clara ran towards them as she saw a pair of deputies lead a very dirty and disoriented Buford Tannen across the street towards the jailhouse. It looked like something serious had happened here. She also had seen a pair of riders gallop around the corner as she approached. They were too far away for Clara to tell for sure, but one of them looked as if he had a long mane of silver hair. Emmett, she called, but there was no reply. She ran down the street to the blacksmith shop and flung open the doors, her momentum carrying her halfway into the barn. Emmett, she called again. Emmett! The shop appeared to be empty. Even the horses were gone. Perhaps it was Emmett she had seen riding away with young Clint, but were. She spotted a tabletop model of some sort pushed up against one of the walls. It was particularly covered by canvas, but once she pulled the covering off, she realized it was a tiny reproduction of Hill Valley much like the map she had seen in the waiting room of the train depot. With Main Street, the courthouse tower, the palace saloon, even the train station. And running from the train station was a set of miniature tracks with a point at the far end of the tracks marked Stop Train Here. A point that, if she understood this model reconstruction, was very near to the ravine where Emmett had saved her. Stop Train Here was this the mystery that Emmett wouldn't tell her about? Why would they want to stop a train? Well, Clara decided she was about to find out. She had seen Clint's horse tied up in front of the barn. She was sure he wouldn't mind if she borrowed it, especially for something as important as this. No matter what was happening, Clara swore this. She would not be left behind. Chapter 19 Marty could see it below, a thick black smudge moving along a thin black line. It was the train just entering Coyote Pass, and by urging their horses over Gale Ridge, they were ahead of it. Now, if they could just keep their horses at a gallop down the steep hill that led into the pass, they had a chance to overtake the train before it passed by the spur with the DeLorean. Doc whooped as he started Archimedes down the hill. Marty's horse slipped after Doc's lead, and a moment later they were galloping full speed across level ground to intercept the train. Marty's horse pulled ahead, as if the stallion knew exactly what was expected of it, and was eager for the rendezvous. It occurred to Marty that if this was indeed Mad Dog Dannon's horse, it probably would be very experienced in this sort of thing. But the train had reached the level ground as well, and it was gaining speed. Marty and Doc both managed to pull their horses parallel to the last passenger car, but their mounts couldn't stand this pace for much longer. Doc reached over and grabbed the ladder on the side of the car, pulling himself off his horse. After steadying himself and taking a deep breath, Doc climbed to the roof of the train car as Archimedes fell behind, and Marty pulled his steed alongside the car and pulled himself up the ladder as well. Once he was sure that Marty was safely on board, Doc led the way forward, running across the tops of the cars towards the locomotive. Doc stopped, though before they reached the tender. 
that car behind the engine where they kept all the coal. Doc raised his hand, the signal, Marty realized, and they both covered their lower face with the, their bandanas. They climbed forward over the covered half of the tender until Marty could see into the cab at the rear of the locomotive. As they had expected, there were two men down below, the engineer and the fireman, both of them facing towards the front of the engine. Doc drew one of the guns he had stored in Archimedes' saddlebag and jumped down behind the engineer. Do what I say and you won't get hurt, Doc said in his most threatening voice, which Marty had to admit didn't sound very threatening. The engineer put up his hands anyway. Marty climbed down into the back of the cab to cover the fireman. Is this a hold up? The engineer asked in a quivering voice. Doc shook his head. It's a science experiment. He waved his gun towards the front of the train. Stop the train just before you hit that switch track up ahead. The engineer did as Doc said, throwing on the brake so that the train squealed to a halt less than ten feet from the point where the track divided. Marty, throw the switch, Doc ordered, then waved his gun at the fireman. You, uncouple the cars from the tender. Both Marty and the fireman jumped from the cab. Marty ran forward to the long wooden pole that served as a switching mechanism. He put his back into it and yanked the track over so that the locomotive would head for the ravine. As Marty ran back to the train, he saw that the fireman had uncoupled the cars as he had been ordered. Doc was staring at the engineer as Marty approached. After a moment's pause, Doc pulled off the engineer's cap, then handed the railroad man his own broad brim black hat. You can get off now, Doc remarked as he put the engineer's cap on his head. The engineer dutifully jumped off. Marty climbed back into the cab as Doc started the locomotive and they slowly pulled away from the rest of the train. Clara urged her horse through the trees. They had been climbing for some time now. She wasn't quite sure where they were, but by keeping the sun more or less in front of her horse as she rode, she should be headed in the general direction of the ravine. The forest ended and she found herself on a bluff overlooking what must be Coyote Pass. There, below her, was what at first she took to be the train, stopped halfway down the valley until she realized that the train's engine was missing. Emmett and Clint must have been here already and taken the locomotive, but why would Emmett want to steal a locomotive? Clara spurred her horse into a gallop, riding along the ridge parallel to the tracks. She had missed them in the past, but she might still be able to head them off on the other side. She would find out if it was the last thing she did in Hill Valley, exactly what Emmett L. Brown was up to. They had driven the locomotive fairly slowly for the half mile or so until they reached the DeLorean. They wanted to conserve as much fuel as possible for their final run at the ravine. But Doc apparently didn't want to depend on wood alone. As soon as he had stopped the locomotive, he instructed Marty to climb down and hand the inventor three cylindrical cloth-covered packages that Doc had stashed in the DeLorean the day before. Marty picked up the first of the three, wrapped in green cloth with a big number one printed on it. It was about a foot and a half long and nine inches around and was surprisingly heavy for so small a package. Marty passed the green package up to Doc, then retrieved the second yellow-covered cylinder he gave to the Doc in turn, then picked up the last of the three wrapped in red. What are these things anyway? Marty asked as he passed this one, too, to Doc. My own version of Presto Logs! 
the inventor replied as he stacked the red cylinder next to the other two in a corner of the cab. Compressed wood with anthracite dust, chemically treated to burn hotter and longer. I use them in my forge so I don't have to stoke it. He pointed at the large number three on the red log. These three in the furnace will ignite sequentially, make the fire burn hotter, kick up the boiling pressure, and make the train go faster. Marty nodded. There was nobody else like Doc. Maybe this new plan of his would actually get the locomotive and the DeLorean up to 88, and they could get out of here before they crashed into the ravine. Doc waved as Marty walked over to the DeLorean. Marty opened the car door and climbed down behind the wheel. The walkie-talkie, the same one they had used to rescue the sports book from Biff, sat on the passenger seat. Testing, Marty, Doc's voice crackled through the walkie-talkie's tiny speaker. Marty picked up the two-way radio and extended the antenna. He pushed a button on the radio side. That's a big ten four, he replied. Then let's go home, Doc's voice replied. Marty released the emergency brake and shifted the car into neutral. Ready to roll, he said into the walkie-talkie. He looked in the rearview mirror as Doc tooted the train whistle. Marty could hear air hiss heavily from the cylinders behind the wheels as Doc released the locomotive's brakes. And then the pistons started to push the wheels as Doc opened the throttle. The engine eased forward. Marty tried to keep from tensing as the locomotive rode forward to the back of the DeLorean. Now, if the cow catcher would just grab the back bumper of the car and push it forward. Doc had assured Marty that the locomotive would not smash through the DeLorean, but still, Doc had been wrong before. Marty was jolted forward. He heard a crunch as the cow catcher hit the bumper. He grabbed for the door handle, but stopped when he realized the DeLorean was moving. The locomotive was pushing the car forward. Marty grinned. They were on their way. Clara had reached the tracks at last, letting her memory of the tabletop model in the blacksmith shop guide her. She had headed for the branch line that ran to the ravine, and she had guessed correctly. There, only a few hundred feet ahead, was the locomotive slowly pulling away. She was close enough to see what she thought was the back of Emmett's head. Although he no longer wore his wide-brimmed black hat, his silver hair now fallen from below a striped engineer's cap. Emmett, she called. The train kept moving. Emmett couldn't hear her over the locomotive engine. But she was too close to stop now. She kept her horse at a gallop. She was almost there. As long as the locomotive didn't gain speed too quickly, she could overtake them in no time at all. Clara leaned forward, kicking her mount's flanks, urging it to greater speed. She was almost to her emmet. Great Scott! Doc pulled the cord that blew the whistle. He had never realized until now how enjoyable it would be to run a locomotive. Of course, Doc reminded himself, enjoyment was surely secondary in the present situation, considering the finite amount of track that had before them and the velocity they had to reach. It was time, quite frankly, to get down to business. Doc thumbed the talk switch on his two-way radio. Marty, are the time circuits on? There was a moment's pause, followed by Marty's voice. Check, Doc. Input to destination time, Doc instructed. October 17th, 1985, 11 a.m. Check, Marty's voice crackled back on the walkie-talkie. Doc picked up the green wrap cylinder. I'm throwing in the presto logs, he announced to the walkie-talkie. 
Once they get going, we'll really get going. Doc took a deep breath and threw the first of the three logs into the boiler. There was no turning back, no matter what he felt. For his sake, for Marty's sake, for the sake of the space-time continuum, it was time to go back to the future. The train was gaining speed, but Clara's horse was faster still. They were closing in on the tender. At a moment like this, she was certainly glad she had led an active childhood back in her native New Jersey. True, she hadn't ridden a horse or done any serious climbing for years, but those were the sort of things you never forget. There was a ladder on the back of the tender. She had to pull her horse next to the ladder, grab onto one of the rungs, and pull herself off her horse and onto the moving train. Not a simple thing to do, but if both horse and train were traveling at the same constant speed, with no jarring distractions, she should be able to accomplish it easily. She pulled the horse parallel to the ladder. She had to do it for her future with Emmett. Marty looked down at the speedometer on the DeLorean. We're running steady at 25 miles an hour, he announced. Not anywhere near as fast as they needed to go, he thought, but didn't say aloud. Doc's voice called reassuringly over the walkie-talkie. The first log should fire any moment now. So this was it, Marty thought. If the effects were going to be anywhere near as spectacular as Doc had described, as soon as that log caught fire, he would have to brace himself for the shock. But if the locomotive didn't explode or lurch forward so violently that it pushed the DeLorean off the tracks, they should really be able to get some speed. Clara reached over and firmly grasped the bottom rung of the ladder. The world exploded around her. There was a great booming roar, and the air above the locomotive was filled with green smoke and flame with a terrible suddenness. The car jerked forward, pulling her from her horse. She managed to grab the ladder with her other hand as well, before the wind hit her, almost tearing her from her perch. The locomotive was traveling at a fantastic speed, and she could barely manage to hang on, her shoes mere inches from the ground, and certain injury. Emmett, she called with all the strength in her, but the locomotive's engine was roaring now. There was no way anybody could hear or help, and with every passing second it felt as if they were going faster still.